Hi everyone, this is Derek with MMA Nut in Studio MMA, and I'm with John Deneher. I said it right, I believe, <laughs> correct? Now, if you don't know, John is in the background of a lot of fighters these days, a lot of um, jiu-jitsu. And I, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you, were, you see a lot of people who, I do jiu-jitsu, I train jiu-jitsu, this is my thing. You actually started cross-training your jiu-jitsu, like you included sambo into it, you included judo into it. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I, I, I don't think any one style of grappling is complete. I think there's something valuable to be learned from every style. Um, and most of the grappling styles, whatever differences there are between them, only really arise out of the rule system of the sport. And uh, as a result, there's valuable insights to be gained for a jiu-jitsu player by studying judo. I, in fact, to be honest with you, I, I don't believe anyone can reach their full potential in, in jiu-jitsu without also studying judo and vice versa. Um, also, freestyle wrestling, sambo, uh, yeah, these all provide valuable insights, valuable ways of entering into uh, uh, your own sport. And uh, I think uh, this is of great value to any student of, of grappling. So now you have fighters who are... I'm a boxer and I train Muay Thai. And I'm a wrestler and I train grappling. So in the future, going forward, if you could have it your way, fighters will cross-train their grappling as opposed to just regular. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, in fact, I don't think they'll ever reach their full maturity level unless they cross-train in this fashion. Now, Henzo helped lock down New York in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He, in my, from this point of view, Henzo kind of owns New York grappling, and then his teammates. Almeida spread out there, Sarah's out there, you're helping them. Now you also got Marcelo Garcia. How is the jiu-jitsu scene in New York? Is it every other school now or how is it? I, I think the jiu-jitsu scene is, is extraordinarily strong. You have a range of very, very fine instructors. You've got Henzo who's been established here, as you say, for a long time. And he had many talented students. Um, uh, Marcelo Garcia is one of the absolute greatest grapplers in the world. Uh, immensely talented man. Uh, he's in New York City. He's got some fine up-and-coming students. He hasn't been there quite as long as Henzo, so it'll take a little more time before you see his students coming out. But he has many, many ta talented grapplers. And of course, he himself is a, a prodigious talent. Um, you also have uh, Vitor Shaolin Ribeiro, who's, again, a tremendously talented guy. You have Lucas Lepre downtown. So New York is well covered by a range of guys, each of whom has their own skill set, their own way of approaching the sport. So it's, I think New York will become a hotbed for Jiu-Jitsu in the future. Now my cameraman, I was explaining to him why traditional jiu-jitsu doesn't agree with 10th planet jiu-jitsu. Because uh, it's, it's not really Brazilian jiu-jitsu if you never try the gi on. And you have, how do you feel that there's so many fighters now who, I personally say it's a business decision to make them a black belt because they've never grappled with the gi. How do you feel about the sport where everyone's now, oh, I'm a black belt despite I've never grappled with the gi. Do you think it's wrong, right? They should rename it American Jiu-Jitsu or? Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a big topic. Um, I think ultimately you've got to look at what are the fundamental differences when you train with or without a gi and um, uh, there's, all, there's more to it than that too. There's historical and cultural influences. I mean, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu per se came from uh, a foreign country and originally Japan and then Brazil and it, it came with a certain mode of competition which was with a gi um, so in a historical and cultural context yeah if you want to learn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu it should be with a gi um, but fighters are not so much inter interested in cultural or aesthetic elements as does it work and uh, and they fight without a gi so uh, I can understand why many Americans say I'm a black belt in grappling uh, without a jacket um, but I can also understand why they would say, well, wait a minute, you're a black belt in grappling, but not Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, so it, it, I, I can't really do the, the question justice in a short time, but uh, that would be one way of looking at it. Now, going forward, where do you see grappling going? Because uh, unfortunately, every time you watch YouTube, there's some guy, oh, I invented a move. It's, the cro it's really just something that it's been put in storage for 50 years. You know, yeah, do you, it often is. Do you see new things coming about? Do you actually see new, I mean, ever since De La Hiva, you haven't really seen a lot in Tornado Guard. You haven't really seen too many improvements on what's been done. Do you see improvements? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I see Jiu-Jitsu jiu jiu and indeed all, all of the, uh, the various grappling arts is rapidly evolving. Um, if you look, for example, at international freestyle wrestling, the moves that are in vogue in the last World Championships are radically different from, say, watching, say, the 1995 World Championships. Um, same thing in Jiu-Jitsu. I, I fully believe that the competitors of today would absolutely smoke 
the champions of my generation when I, when I started. Um, I do believe it's an evolving and improving sport. Now, does that mean that new moves are coming along? Well, I do think that uh, the technical application of moves today is better than it was, say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, the, the fundamental moves of the sport don't change, but many of the subtle setup and grip entries into those moves do change. And so uh, many people, when they look at jiu-jitsu matches, they only see the result. They see how the, mo how, the, how the match ended. And they don't see the many subtle details of grip, positioning, uh, control nuances that set up the moves. And those subtle elements of the sport, they do change. And that's why I believe one generation of jiu-jitsu uh, in the future will generally be better than the generation that preceded it. Now, what you just said brings me to a point. I'm a member of uh, Carlson Gracie in, here in Chicago, and I always tell people who just come into the gym, stay off YouTube. How do you feel YouTube has affected it? Because you have a 19-year-old a fresh off the street, and you're establishing your jiu-jitsu experience, and you have a 19-year-old saying, well, this is how you do the, the triangle from the mount. And the, the, do you think YouTube is a negative impact or a positive impact with people just trying crazy flying arm bars? Uh, I think the internet is one of those uh, one of those medium where it can either be very very good or very very damaging. Uh, I think there's a simple test for whether or not uh, uh, someone is a legitimate teacher on, on YouTube. And what's their pedigree? Uh, are they a world champion? If I'm watching Hodger Gracie demonstrate a move on YouTube, of course I'm going to take it seriously. It's Hodger Gracie. Uh, if I see Marcelo Garcia, do, I'm going I'm to take it seriously. It's Marcelo Garcia. Um, but if I see someone who's I've never heard of and has no record or no affiliation with anyone who or no one speaks highly of him who who I do trust, um, then I I probably would be somewhat suspicious. Um, but I will say though that. Um, in the defense of such people, I, I, you'd be pleasantly surprised at how you can learn valuable insights from unexpected sources. Every so often I'll see a, a white belt student on my mats who does something ostensibly wrong but gets a good result. I look at what happened and I play with it and something valuable might come out of it. You never know. But uh, in the main, I, I wouldn't say to young students, never watch YouTube. I would just say watch YouTube but watch with caution. Um, simply test the pedigree of the people who are teaching. Are, are they legitimate? You know, do they have like a uh, a legitimate title, a world title, for example, and then learn if they if they do. Now you you are actually a you said one of my favorite quotes, and you've mentioned other grapplers. My favorite quote you ever said is you had um, a fighter fighting Jake Shields, and you had said there are black belts, and then there are black belts. Do you think that that's widely understood? You know, someone says, well, Marcelo Garcia is a black belt, and Jake Shields is a black belt. Why can't he? Do you think? Can you please explain the levels of black belts, how that works, when you learn, you know, positioning control, and do you think it's a widely understood that there are black belts and then there are black belts? Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, I think many people tend to overestimate the importance of a black belt. Um, a black belt really just demonstrates that you've been in the sport for a long time and now you're ready to start your serious learning. Um, it, it's shown that you're a serious student. Uh, you've been in the sport now for five to ten years, you've shown some dedication, now it's time to get serious about the sport. Um, so, so don't think you know you get a black belt suddenly. Yeah, you're, you're, I'm yeah, I'm God. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, moreover, just because you're a black belt, black belts get given for different reasons too. You know, if someone's 60 years old and I give them a black belt, that's kind of conditional, you know. Um, whereas, you know, Hodger Gracie gets his black belt. It's because he won the world championships as a brown belt by submitting everybody. It's a whole different uh, level. So I think people have a pretty good understanding that there are different levels of black belt and that just because you're a black belt doesn't mean that much. Um, you know, I, I, I know plenty of black belts who, if they got into a street fight, I, I wouldn't be confident that they would always prevail um, if they fought a, a sufficiently difficult opponent. Um, then there's other black belts I know who I, I would assume in almost every case they would win a street altercation to put things in, in one context. Um, I think most people are pretty aware that there's different levels of, of black belt. And I'm going to go back to a fight of Henzo's, and I'll also, do you guys train in this way? Henzo, when he fought Frank Shamrock, Frank was looking for a way out. People can say that that's not true, but everyone in the grappling arts knows the level of pressure that Henzo is bringing, where you can't even get an inch to move. And to, is that something you guys work on? Like, every school is good at something. Here in Chicago, when I was in California at Hey Diogo's, we had always said, well, the guys in New York, 
really good at the arm and guillotine. A lot of good guys at that. Stay away from that. A lot of guys here good at the triangle. Now, do you guys work things like that and work your levels of pressure like an aggressive constant? I think that most people in Jiu-Jitsu learn by role models. And your most immediate role models are the guys who are better than you around you. Okay, and um, uh, I'm at a gym where I remember when Henzo started first developing the arm and guillotine, I, I was on the receiving end of that as a blue belt <laughs> on many, many occasions. And um, I quickly developed a, uh, an enthusiasm for the arm and guillotine as a result, and also a healthy respect for it. Um, uh, it's, it's just one of those things where someone who's just constantly kicking your butt with it, you, you learn to respect it. Um, Henzo does have a, a very, very powerful top pressure game. He's very aggressive in the way he approaches his jiu-jitsu, and that kind of fed on to us as students. Um, then people would come in visiting people. I remember Dean Lister came in when I was a blue belt, and um, he had a big effect on me. With his, He had a superb leg lock game back in a time when many people just didn't have leg locks. And he, he really encouraged me to, to, to learn the leg lock game early on, and um, I'm forever thankful to him for that. Um, uh, so, so different people come in, and they, they become your role models. And, uh, and so it's natural that in, in one school, where there's, say, two or three role models who have a certain kind of game, that they should influence the other students. It's, just a, it's a natural part of learning. Like I'm, I'm sure if you go to Hodger Gracie's school, I'm sure they're all very good at Jujijime, the cross-collar strangle. You know, it's, just, it's natural. Now, last question. I know you got to get going eventually, but this is a question that a lot of people don't actually talk about in jiu-jitsu when you get promoted. You have a blue belt or a purple belt or a brown belt or a black belt. How do you roll with the people who are belts under you? Do you crush them? Do you, but, you know, but not be a jerk? How do, you, how do you tell your students to go with lighter belts who they know they can beat but don't want to be an ass and at the same time want to get a good workout? How does that go? I, I think that ultimately every time you roll, you should come off the mats thinking you know more about the sport of jiu-jitsu than when you walked onto the mats. So I think you should roll at a pace and a, uh, a level which is appropriate to that learning process. If I'm rolling with someone who's a complete white belt, of course I'm, I'm going to have one thing in mind. How can I improve, say, one move that I'm working on that day? And I'll roll at a pace which enables me to improve on that move. Um, if I'm rolling with someone who's better than me, then it might just be survival. Okay, okay, I've got to practice my bottom side control or something like that. Um, but I should walk off the mats knowing in my heart that in some small way I'm better than I was when I walked on the mats. And that should always be the focus of your training, especially day by day. Um, and just as long as you're doing that, then whatever pace you select, whether your training partner be above you or below you, will work well. Thank you so much for all your time, man. It was so great. Thank you. Thank you.